We can begin. Okay. Buenos días. Buenos días a todos, todas. Eh, por deferencia al conferenciante, voy a pasar el inglés y en todo caso, si queréis, en las preguntas eh, podemos combinar el español y, y el inglés. Good morning. Within the framework of the activities organized in this faculty on the occasion of the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian People, we are fortunate to have Dr. Ramzi Baroud, who will give a lecture entitled Towar, a different understanding of the Palestinian question. The conference has, has been organized by the Department of International Relations and Global History and by the Complutense Research Group on the Maghreb and the Middle East, with the support of Casa Arabe and the BDS network. Ramzi Barut is a Palestinian-American journalist and analyst, editor of the Palestinian Chronicle, and senior researcher at the Center for Islam and Global Affairs, Istanbul Zaim University, and at the Afro Middle East Center in Johannesburg. Ramzi Barut is author of several books. His latest work with Ilan Pape is entitled Our Vision of for Liberation Engage Palestinian Leaders and Intellectuals Speak, published this month, November. Hmm? Yes, yeah. The Palestinian question is extremely relevant on the international scene. It is a paradigmatic case of an unresolved colonial issue, an anomalous prolonged occupation with a, with a large scale humanitarian impact. The Palestinians are the largest group of long term refugees internationally. It's also a failure of the multilateralism to resolve a conflict and it is a scenario in which the real politics of states prevails over the norms and principles of international law and human rights. It is also an issue that mobilizes public opinion globally. I will not deprive our guest of more time. I give you the floor, and after the conference, we will have the possibility to ask questions and to debate. Uh, dear Ramsey, you are at the floor. And welcome to Complutense University. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's my pleasure, my honor to be uh, here speaking to you. Thank you all for uh, coming to hear me speak, and, and I wish you all the success with your um, studies and, and, and uh, your future. Um, I am here to um, attempting to offer a different way of understanding the situation of Palestine. Now, some of us might be familiar, I think every person is familiar with the situation in Palestine, Israel, but in different degrees. Some people study at the university, uh, some people are active, uh, involved, some people might be even members or, or, or sympathizers with the BDS, the Boycott, Divestment and Sanctions Movement, and some people might glean their information from television. I mean, you can't escape it when there's a war on Gaza, when there's a, an event, usually bloody violent event, you can't really escape it. And as a result, pretty much all of us formulate an idea about what's happening in Palestine. Um, generally speaking, they say that most Americans are sympathetic with Israel, not with Palestine. And we know why, because of the way that mainstream corporate media uh, incorporates Palestine into their coverage. The angry Palestinian terrorists, you know, the, the violent uh, scenes, the, the chants, the religious doctrines that uh, are often affiliated with Palestine and so forth, when Israel is perceived in a different way. Israel, the victim, Israel, the, uh, a country that is in constant state of self-defense, the Israeli democracy that is struggling to survive amid the hordes of barbaric Palestinians and Arabs and Muslims and so forth. And as a result, vast majority of Americans think 
that they actually understand the situation in Palestine. You ask them any question, they have no idea. They can't even find Palestine on a map. Um, in fact, there was um, uh, an, uh, a public opinion poll conducted by Zogby International polling company in the US that found out that a larger number of Americans think that Palestinians are occupying Israel, not Israel is occupying Palestinians. So the, the foundational knowledge on Palestine and Israel tend to be misguided, confused, nonsensical even. Now, I was born and raised in a refugee camp in the Gaza Strip. My family come from a village in historic Palestine, today's Israel, called Beit Daras. Uh, the, village, the people of the village of Beit Daras were known among ordinary Palestinians of being very stubborn, very strong, very stubborn. And one of the stereotypes that people from that village have very large heads. And it's not true. I do, I do not think I have a very large head. But the stereotype is based on the assumption that if you are stubborn, you have a large head. And the, the reason that's important, because when the Zionist movement uh, invaded or ethnically cleansed nearly one million Palestinian out of their Palestinian historic homeland in 1947-48, the people, the peasants and farmers of Beit Daras fought. They fought back. That includes my grandfather, Muhammad, and that includes many of my relatives. They fought three separate battles. Um, at times, they fought with old rifles that they had sold the gold of their wives and purchased uh, uh, old Turkish rifles, and they fought, uh, used it to fight against the, the Zionist militias and, and against the British colonialists who were in Palestine at the time. The third battle resulted in what they call the Beit Daras Massacre, or the Great uh, Beit Daras Massacre, when hundreds of the people in the village were killed. The village was ethnically cleansed, and it was uh, completely erased and destroyed. But of course, Beit Daras is one of nearly 500 Palestinian villages that were destroyed uh, in order for the state of Israel to be established. So this is not a conflict. The term conflict is not the right term, because these are not two separate people who are disagreeing over territories, over politics, over ideology. There was a nation called the Palestinian nation and people that existed in Palestine that were completely erased, removed, pushed out. I don't think there is a single country in the world that doesn't have a Palestinian refugee. In fact, just to be more accurate, when I moved, I worked in a, in a sultanate called Brunei, if you are familiar with that, is in the Borneo Island in, in, in Asia. And I became the first Palestinian refugee who lived in Brunei. And, and doing that, we covered the entire universal landscape where Palestinian refugees live. But of course, if you go to Syria, if you go to Lebanon, if you go to Jordan, uh, to Iraq, to Egypt, you will find millions of Palestinian refugees who are the descendants of the original Palestinian refugees who were kicked out of their Palestinian homeland. Um, the terminology that we use to describe these events can be quite dehumanizing for Palestinians and misleading too, quite misleading. Um, the idea that this is a conflict, the idea that Palestinians are factional people who are never united and can never agree to anything, the classification of Palestinians as terrorists or victims, by the way. I mean, many of the pro-Palestine community around the world likes to see Palestinians quite often in this, you know, in this victimhood, you know, thing. But, but it's not true. Yes, we have been victimized, but we haven't embraced our victimhood, or we are not victims. We fight back in every possible uh, manifestation, every possible occasion, every possible platform, whether on the ground in Gaza, or intellectually at every American university, every Euro European academic platform, uh, in, in every walks of life, you will find Palestinians asserting themselves, asserting their identities, asserting their rights, 
as a people, deserve to be recognized as a people, deserving of freedom, deserving of justice. Now, why, why offer an alternative view of Palestine and Israel? Why can't just say that and that's the end of the story? Well, since the Oslo peace accords were signed in 1993, prior to that there, were, there was the Madrid talks, and I'm sure that many of you, especially studying political science and Middle East history, familiar with the Madrid talks, which I think the anniversary was, the 30th year anniversary was, which is very recent. Uh, Palestinians were kind of forced into this political compromise. We needed to change everything about us. We needed to appeal to a Western audience. We were told that the world has changed. The Soviet Union is no longer in existence. Counting on the global south doesn't count for anything anymore. America is now the single and most powerful rural, ruler of the world. And as a result, you have to play the American game. So they dragged us into Madrid, then to Oslo, then to Washington, Paris, and so forth. During that time, a new Palestinian political discourse um, was brought about. A discourse in which Palestinians have to constantly demonstrate that they are not terrorists, that they are moderates, that they are people that America, Washington, Tel Aviv, and Oslo, and so forth, we can do business with these people. As a result, we had to put our hats down and put on a different hat to appeal to this new uh, geopolitical formation resulting from American global dominance. In the process of doing so, we accepted that our people are divided to two kinds. The good Palestinians, these are the moderates. These are the people who believe in the peace process. These are the people who believe in the two-state solutions. And of course, they were rewarded very handsomely. They are very wealthy Palestinians. They live in massive villas in Ramallah. They have VIP cards. They can travel. They can go anywhere and so forth. And there's, of course, the bad Palestinians, the terrorists, the terrorist sympathizers, the extremists, the radicals, the anti-peace uh, people and so forth. And these are the people we cannot talk to, we cannot make uh, peace with, we have absolutely no sympathy for whatsoever. Um, and as a result, you have this kind of dichotomy that was created as a result. And Palestinians have to be constantly, if I am to speak to you here in Madrid, I have to be very careful in what language I use, because I don't want, God forbid, to be misunderstood for a Hamas guy or a communist or a you know, or Islamic Jihad and that sort of thing. So I have to be very careful what terminology I use. And it has to be a terminology that appeals to your um, frame of reference, whether politically, morally, or any other, right? But of course, this is not the truth about Palestine. If you go to Gaza, this is not the reality you're gonna see there. These class classifications you see in the media are of no relevance to the truth of what is actually happening on the ground. I was born and raised in Gaza, and that matters so much because when I came to Seattle um, about 25 years ago, I found out that the Palestine that they speak of, whether in the media or uh, the Palestine solidarity groups and so forth, is entirely different than the Palestine I know. So how do you do that? How do you fight two pro dominant narratives on the same issue? where your narrative is not even recognized whatsoever. Uh, of course, I'm not the only Palestinian historian who has done that, but what we are hoping to do is now that the Oslo peace process has completely failed. The two-state solutions is never really what was a possible or plausible reality to begin with, and now it's an impossibility. And there is a rising consciousness around the world, whether the, in the United States, where there is uh, a great deal of upheaval over the, you know, kind of challenging mainstream ideas and narratives, the Black Lives Matter movement, for example, the Native American, the rise of the Native American intellectual, the, 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 the emphasis on intersectionality in the way that we uh, 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 communicate and the way we relate to each other. There is a need now for the Palestinians to bring that third narrative and say Palestine is neither a terrorist nor a victim, good or bad, moderates or extremists. Palestinians are a people 
who have been uprooted from their homeland. They have been ethnically cleansed, and they have been living in refugee camps. They are living under siege in Gaza. They are living in an apartheid regime uh, in the West Bank. They are living as second or third or fourth class citizens in Israel itself. Uh, they are denied many of the basic rights that many people around the world take for granted. They, they, they are fighting for recognition, they are fighting for rights, for freedom, uh, and they are fighting for a homeland. And as a result, I figured that the best way to accentuate that is to go back to the very, very beginning and tell the story of Palestine from the very start. Now, the story of Palestine from the very start is not the story of Yasser Arafat, is not the story of Zionism, is not the story of Hamas versus Fatah, is the story of ordinary people. And if you look at history, and this applies to any history, by the way, if you look at the history of this city, if you look at the history of this city from the, the point of view of the rich and powerful and the millionaires and, and the big families and, and, and so forth, and if you look at the history from the viewpoint of the working class, of ordinary people, of people who are struggling on a daily basis to make ends meet, you're going to find that you have a completely different version of Madrid's history. Apply this to any situation, any national struggle around the world, any liberation movement around the world, apply it to Palestine, you will find that the reality is somewhat different. And, and what it requires from us is a deeper understanding as opposed to judgment. A deeper understanding as opposed to judgment. Palestine is not a football game. You're not with this side or with that side. It can't be seen as that. Palestine is, is and, and it can't be reduced into that, well, it's a very complex problem. Oh, it's been going on for thousands of years. Oh, this is about religion. There are no rights and wrongs in that. No, it's not. And, and it's a modern, modern so-called conflict. Palestine was a colonized country, like most countries in the Southern Hemisphere. And that, colon that, that, that raw, uh, old definition of colonialism as, as it existed in the 19th century, 20th century, in much of the Middle East and the Southern Hemisphere, in Palestine, it remains as such until today. It has been redefined in many parts of the world. Some countries have achieved their freedom. They have wrestled their freedom in, 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 its, you know, in, in, in its entirety. Others are still negotiating a position. Some countries and, you know, are maybe, maybe independent by name, but in actuality, not so very independent. Uh, you see what the, the, the recent conflict between Lebanon and Saudi Arabia, for example. You can't really argue that Lebanon is a sovereign country when the Saudi money and, uh, and the power and influence of the Gulf has much to say over the politics of, of, of Lebanon. But Palestine has never enjoyed any kind of political transformation whatsoever. To the contrary, we're going back to this kind of era of dark age politics, apartheid walls, people's in cages, children being shot by snipers in Gaza, workers being pushed in these, um, you know, at checkpoints as if they are cattle trying to get to work and children going to school and having to go through Israeli soldiers in, in Naples and in Hebron and Ramallah and so forth. And their family would have to wait on the other side of the military uh, 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 the military checkpoint or the military, uh, you know, uh, uh, point that is, is uh, created by the soldiers. And if the soldiers are not in a good mood or the, the soldier is napping, you have to wait for your child for hours until the soldier wakes up from his nap and let your child back home. This is the very daily reality. In my opinion, there is no conflict here. And you can't be taking sides as if Israel has a point. What is the point of colonialism? What is the moral justification of apartheid? What is the moral justification of military occupation? There can be no moral justification, and therefore this cannot be perceived as a conflict in, 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 in the political science sort of terms. Now, what I did is I did my PhD at the University of Exeter in people's history. I was fascinated with this idea 
What if people have their own history? Now, I know Howard Zinn and many other uh, uh, American and, 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 and European and, and international uh, intellectuals and historians have tried to imagine that alternative way of seeing things. But that has rarely been applied to Palestine. Now, it doesn't mean that the history of ordinary people in Palestine has never been told. But it wasn't really told as if to make a point that people, as a collective, if we understand their story as a collective, they can indeed be perceived to be political agents. How can you understand the siege on Gaza, the current Israeli siege and blockade on Gaza from the viewpoint of ordinary people, but told as, a, as one singular historical narrative? So about 15 years ago, I began fiddling with that idea. What if? And I started by telling the story of my family. My father was a freedom fighter. Um, I had other books published before that, but that book in particular, my father was a freedom fighter, Gaza's Untold Story, allowed me to, to play around with the concept, but using a, a, a principle in academia, we use positionality, we call positionality. Positionality is when the researcher, the academic, is also part of the story. If you are a, a black activist, or a black intellectual in America, and you are trying to tell the history of slavery, how can you pretend that this is not the story of your people? How can you pretend that, oh, I am objective, I cannot deal with this issue, I am, at this point, I have no color, but you do have a color, you are a black man, you are a black woman, and you have to communicate that considering the fact that your ancestors were slaves. So positionality is kind of a non-elitist form of academic research tool that has been used, especially and exploited really to the maximum by many intellectuals in the Southern Hemisphere or nations that have struggled against uh, marginalization, against uh, um, all sorts of, sorts of oppressions and so forth. So I use that to tell the story of my family, but in telling the story of my family, I also try to tell the story of the Nakba. The, the Nakba is an Arabic term that means the uh, catastrophe. It was that catastrophic destruction of the Palestinian homeland in 1947-48. Now, if you look at the story of ordinary people of how the Nakba actually happened, it's almost entirely different than the story of the Nakba as told by traditional academia. This is, you know, it's, the story of the Nakba is not the story of the Zionist movement. The Zionist movement was established by Herzl in the late 19th century with the idea of creating a Jewish homeland in, in Palestine. And then you kind of jump from there to the Balfour Declaration and of 1917 and the Sykes-Picot Agreement and so forth. These academic markers and the way they try to communicate history can be helpful and maybe you can pass the exam and get an A+, plus, but it really doesn't give you the real depth that would allow you to understand history the way it should be understood. So, um, as a result, I would like to read a small passage uh, of, from the book, uh, My Father Was a Freedom Fighter. And this is uh, my grandfather, Muhammad. My father is also called Muhammad. Um, is taking his family after the massacre of Beit Daras, and they are fleeing Beit Daras, and they are going to, um, they don't know where they're going. They're just fleeing. They ended up being in a Gaza refugee camp. But this is just a very small glimpse of that scene of them fleeing to uh, leaving the massacre behind and looking for a safe place. Grandpa Muhammad mounted his faithful donkey with few of the family's belongings and his young daughter, Maryam. Ibrahim was in his mother's arms. Ahmed walked alongside his father, and my father, Muhammad, barefoot and confused, trotted behind. It was another trail of tears of sorts. Neither parent had answers to the children's insistent questions, where are we going? They headed south. That was all they knew. First to Asdud, then to Hamame, then to Gaza. Everywhere they settled, they were chased with mortars and airplanes and bombs. As the bombardments progressed and more villages were raised, the roads became more and more populated. 
Some people carrying on with a great sense of urgency, others wandering aimlessly in a daze. Grandpa Muhammad was a man of faith. He insisted that if the Arabs were to abandon Palestinians, God would not. Muddied with bloody feet and empty bellies, the children could hardly argue with their father's wisdom. Even as they passed an occasional body in the middle of the road, or a frantic mother running in the opposite direction, weeping for her lost children. God will take care of us, Grandpa Muhammad encouraged. Yet there was no one in sight, but fleeing refugees, blown up bodies, starved children, and crying women. What kept Beit Daras standing for a thousand years can always bring it back, he insisted. But the many tracks, but the many trucks, and, thou and, and a thousand, sorry. I lost my place. But the many trucks and numerous donkeys walking the dirt road, loaded with whatever families managed to salvage, told of another story. The number of refugees was growing by the hour. In Beit Daras, everybody knew everybody, but not anymore. The number of familiar faces was dwindling. Many died, many fled elsewhere. And those heading to Gaza were now joined by so many new faces, equally pale and tearful, from numerous villages that extended beyond the world of Beit Daras. Muhammad, the son, was hungry and he was tired. The son was oppressive and he, and he was oppressive and beat down on the back of, of his neck. Trotting behind his mother, he stopped under the shade of a tree for just a few minutes. It didn't take long for the boy to regain his strength as he ran ahead to catch up with his family. Meanwhile, Zainab discovered that Muhammad was no longer behind her and couldn't remember the last time she had seen him. She became hysterical, calling his name and running aimlessly. A deep-seated pain in her belly warned her of losing her boy forever. She asked everybody she passed, peace be upon you, have you seen my boy Muhammad or for God's sake, have you seen my son? He's a 10 years old and he went missing this morning. But she was one of so many that had become separated from their children. Mothers and fathers would express their commiseration. Others would say nothing. But for a short moment, they would share a knowing gaze and then sadly move on. After an eternity had passed that afternoon, Zainab spotted her son, gently tugging on the sleeve of another mother, repeating the same supplications as Zainab. Peace be upon you. Have you seen my mother? In a mix of rage and relief, Zainab swept Muhammad up into her arms, chastising him while smothering him with kisses. For the rest of the journey, Zainab would never let anyone fall behind. Now, one thing that I find really interesting about Palestinian history is, is this concept of the crossing, the idea that you are trying to get from this point to this point, but you can't. Like for 70, nearly 75 years, we've been kind of trapped in this issue. I have been to Palestine, to Gaza, to see my family once, in the last 25 years, because Israel no longer allows me to go to the West Bank, and I'm not allowed to go to Gaza. My, Gaza, my, my family in Gaza cannot leave and they cannot see me. Well, this is a microcosm of millions of Palestinians are all trapped. Um, I remember seeing uncles of mine at, uh, when I was a kid at, at some fence separating Gaza from Egypt where my uncle would be over there and my mother would be over there and they would be yelling at each other and they can't communicate. Separation, exile, 
crossings, checkpoints, walls, fences. It's constantly, it's just part of our story and it's, it's incorporated to our story in such a way that we are not even, like sometimes we don't even think about it. It's just, it's like for us, it's a second nature, not being able to see each other for such prolonged periods of time. And if you leave, can you come back? And if you come back, can you leave again? How many students, Palestinian students in Gaza, you will find this very strange phenomenon because Israel would allow students to leave Gaza to Egypt, for example, where they can go to other countries, but they would have them sign a document that they are leaving for three years. If they don't come back within that period to renew their papers, they, are never allowed, they lose their citizenship forever. Now, why three years? Because to have a BA, a bachelor degree, you need four years. So when the student comes back three years later and say, can I renew my, my agreement? They will say, okay, we will, but what are you gonna give us? That's where the Israeli Shin Beit, the in Israeli intelligence. We need names. Who are the Palestinian students active uh, in Egypt? Who is saying what and where? And you have to give them the information. So many students, of course, would rather lose all of their educational opportunities and, and go and live in Gaza for the rest of their lives so that they are not serving as collaborators for the Israeli intelligence. So you have this strange phenomenon where you have thousands of Palestinians who never finished the degree. They got so, so close, and it was time for them to go maybe defend their dissertation, and that's the time where they are pulled in, and then they live the rest of their lives unable to leave and unable to finish their education. So this entrapment, it's, it's, it continues until today. And this is why we say the Nakba, that catastrophe of 1948, and, and do stop me, Professor, at any point, because I might uh, exceed my time. Um, this is why we say the Nakba is not an event in history. Many historians make that mistake, by the way. They perceive the Nakba as an event that transpired and concluded, and it was over. May, June 1948, that's the end of it. Well, some repercussions until the end of 1948, and that's the end of it. But that didn't really happen. The Nakba is an ongoing event. Maybe that was the beginning of it, but it's an ongoing event. I am unable to see my sister in Gaza because of the Nakba. Uh, children in Gaza are, you know, they, they, they are not able to go to hospitals or to schools or whatever in the West Bank because of the Nakba. Because we are still refugee. I'm an American citizen, but I am still a refugee. That's my status in the eye of Israel. I am a refugee. And until the issue of Palestinian refugees is resolved, there can never be a peaceful resolution to any of this. And that's one of the, one of the biggest traps of Madrid and Oslo and all of this. They wanted to talk about everything, but don't talk about the refugees. That's an issue that has been relegated to the past, to history. But most Palestinians are refugees. And until we deal with the original injustice that ended up having us either live in permanent exile or living in refugee camps under atrocious and inhumane conditions, how can we move forward in this conversation? You see, so a few years later, I wrote a, another book called The Lost Earth. And The Lost Earth is the story of Palestinian refugees. What I was trying to show here is to demonstrate that the, the, the centrality of the Palestinian refugee experience to the Palestinian political discourse, that this is not a humanitarian issue. It cannot be resolved by money. It's a political issue, and it has to be resolved through uh, honest and decided and, 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 and strong political resolutions in which that would have to be imposed on Israel. I mean, this whole idea, this whole idea that you can't impose anything on Israel. You can impose anything on apartheid South Africa. You can punish any country that invades any other country. You can put sanctions on countries that supposedly disrespect international law. But when it comes to Israel, you can't impose. You can't pressure. This is why the BDS movement is very, very important. When we say BDS and we say boycotting Israel, 
We mean that this is the first time in many years that we actually have a platform that communicates in a very clear political language that Israel would never relent, apartheid would never end, military occupation would never be dismantled until Israel is held accountable. And if, if civil society is needed for that accountability, then we call on global civil society to stand by us and put the needed pressure on Israel to understand that there is a cost to all of this. There is a cost to the occupation. There is a cost to the siege. There is a cost to killing thousands of, of, of innocent civilians in Gaza. It cannot be treated as a normal political event that has to be resolved through polite conversations between the occupied and oppressed Palestinians and the Israeli occupier and oppressor. So this is the trajectory of my work, trying and Im to imagine a different narrative on Palestine that puts ordinary people as the central component in that narrative and allows us to see Palestinians not just as human beings, because Palestinians have been dehumanized for such a long time, but to also see Palestinians as agents of change, as political agents, as people who are capable of changing their reality. I'll tell you the truth. We haven't had very good luck with our leaderships. This has been going on for such a long time. Not because Palestinians make bad leaders. It's not true. But because the real Palestinian leadership is never allowed to actually represent the Palestinian people. Our best leaders are in prison as we speak. Our best leaders have been assassinated. Hundreds of Palestinians have been assassinated in recent years. And in fact, if you go to the assassin assassination records of Israel, you, you'll find Palestinians assassinated in Greece, in Italy, in Tunisia, in, 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 uh, in, uh, in Spain, in uh, Cyprus. Cyprus particularly, in Dubai, in Malaysia as of, of late, they go after the ones that they see real promise of real leadership, and boom, they're out. The leadership that is, operate, that is allowed to operate are those who are willing to play the game uh, according to Israeli rules. So the Israelis tolerate them. They don't have a problem with that. So if we had such bad leadership, why are we even talking about Palestine? Why is Palestine such an important item in the evening news? Why Palestine is such an important issue and people worldwide, from ordinary people to top celebrities in Hollywood, have to take a stance on Palestine? Why? What makes Palestine so special to that extent? Of course, it's not Israel, it's not Zionism, because as far as Zionism, is concerned, they want you to believe everything is normal. Let's not even talk about these issues. It's not the Arab world. I mean, we understand the reality in the Middle East. They could care less about Palestinians as far as the leaderships are concerned. And the people are fighting their own fights for survival from Sudan to Yemen to Tunisia to Egypt to Syria and so forth. But here's the answer. The reason we are talking about Palestine is because of the Palestinian people. And I really don't mean th this as a sentimental thing. I don't mean it as a sentimental. It's not supposed to be an emotional, I want an emotional reaction from that. It is the truth. Because the Palestinian people have never ceased resisting for over 70 years. From the early Fidaiyin movement in, in Gaza in the, 19, uh, the early 1950s, all the way until today. And they resisted in all the manifestation of resistance whether through arms or through popular resistance or through art, through poetry. And in fact, I wrote a book and I'm not promoting my books because I don't have them. So you can't, you can't, you can't say that I'm doing self-promotion here. But I wanted to also imagine the story of Palestinian prisoners. You see, Palestinian prisoners in particular, in particular has been a difficult story to sell in the West. Why? Because they are prisoners. Some of them are accused of killing Israeli soldiers. How do you promote that story? How do you create that as a brand? So I noticed that even within the Palestine movement, they try to avoid talking about prisoners. But Palestinian prisoners, the 5,000s of them in prison right now, and the nearly 1 million Palestinian who has experienced time in prison since the 1967 until today, is a microcosm 
of the larger Palestinian besiegement, the larger Palestinian imprisonment. How can you not talk about that story? So I interviewed dozens of Palestinian prisoners, their families. Actually, we spoke to some prisoners in prison who had smuggled cell phones hidden in their prison cells, and we got their story out. And the story wasn't a story of questioning the motives behind Palestinian prisoners standing for themselves or joining certain resistance movements and so forth. But rather, the question, the primary question we asked was this. Tell us a single event in your life that defines you. And from there, it could be an actual experience being tortured, the day you met, the last time you saw your mother because you, you, before you were sent to 50 years in an Israeli prison, whatever it is, it could be a dream that you've had, a recurring dream, and the meaning and symbolism of that dream. So the idea here, we're not questioning, we're not accusing, we're not pointing fingers. Tell us your story the way you want your story to be told. And then we tried to connect these various narratives so that by the end of the day, you will get this comprehensive story of the collective Palestinian prison experience. So now we are kind of, and, and I am happy to report that other Palestinian writers are now doing the same thing. They are kind of, you know, trying to discover a new way of telling the Palestinian story without judgment, the Palestinian story without dehumanization, and the Palestinian story from a very Palestinian viewpoint. Because until the Palestinian people are, this, are the center of the Palestinian narrative, then there is no story to be told. It's a, it's a fraudulent story. It's a dishonest story. It has to be told by the Palestinian people themselves. Um, I think I'm going to stop here. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to take any questions you have. Okay, then we have time to collect several uh, questions, answer, comments. Uh, there will be a micro. We begin here in the corner and, and later. Perhaps we can collect a couple of questions sure. yeah. and, and you, you react. Hi, uh, what do you think, uh, we, uh, which could be the future of the region of Palestine? Because Israel is a several country now, and maybe uh, it's a very difficult, compared to some years ago, to disoccupy the region. I don't know if... <laughs> I understood, yeah. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, from the perspective of uh, the solidarity movement uh, outside of Palestine, how should we balance somehow the desire for an anti-colonial, anti-imperialist policy in the Middle East with the rise of uh, movements that claim to be anti-colonial and anti-imperialist, but they also reproduce uh, narratives such as Islamic fu fundamentalism, uh, uh, yeah, narratives. How should we balance those two kind of of struggles that people such as us, I think, want to tackle at the same time? Now, when you say solidarity movement, you're referring to the Palestine solidarity. Yeah, movement. but also in Lebanon or yeah, with Hezbollah or in Afghanistan with the Taliban. How should we balance this kind of two, two struggles? Yeah. Thanks. Hay una tercera ahí en, y luego en la, en la segunda ronda, en la segunda ronda, Polina. Um, so a few days ago, we had an MUN, the Model United Nations, in here, and here. Yes. Um, so the delegate for, uh, from the mission, from the Palestinian mission in Spain, came and gave us a, and gave us a workshop on, on the Palestinian situation. He was, uh, he's Haldun Al Masri, and I asked him, 
Are you optimistic on the situation, on the potential future of Palestine? And if so, how and why? Thanks. Perhaps. I mean, perhaps you can you can um, uh, answer and and we follow. La segunda en la segunda vuelta, de acuerdo? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, the first and, and, and last question, um, the first and third question are somewhat linked uh, because they deal with the, the future of the of Palestine and, and the future of that region. <clears throat> Um, it's difficult to use the word optimistic um, when we are dealing with a reality in which people die every day. It's very difficult. And, and I'm aware of my position here speaking about it in Madrid, not in Gaza. Uh, but that uh, in mind, I would say, yes, I am optimistic. I am optimistic um, for several reasons. Number one, the fact, as I stated earlier, that uh, the Palestinian people continue to struggle and to con continue to resist with the same kind of determination that their ancestors have. It tells me that there is this spirit of resistance in Palestine that cannot be quilled, period. And when people resist, they have to achieve. Uh, they, they will eventually achieve. Uh, their objective. Because it's, it's not the matter whether the Palestinians have the material power to overcome Israel, which is the strongest uh, uh, army in the Middle East. It doesn't work that way. Um, you mentioned Hezbollah. Hezbollah, along with other Lebanese resistance, managed to uh, push Israel out uh, in, in 2000. Um, most of the Hezbollah fighter were, fighters were not even born when Israel uh, uh, or, or were, were children when Israel uh, invaded in Lebanon uh, and southern Lebanon, in particular, in 1978 and again in 1982. They were children or, or they were not born. And it's that generation that actually managed to kick Israel out of Lebanon using very simple means. Um, I went to South Lebanon and I met with many of um, many people there who were part of that resistance. And there was one thing that I've noticed. Uh, and it, it's really something that it cannot be described in technical terms. There was something about the spirit of the people there, their desire, their, their want to push Israel out, their desire to resist, that, that really made it almost impossible for any other scenario but Israel to be pushed out. So I think the Palestinians will eventually be able to prevail. The question is how, and the question is rather, um, what would the region look like in, in whatever that future is? I think any discussion about a two-state solution is a nonsensical discussion. It's not about, should it be one state or two states? I think there's the, not just from a, a justice-oriented point of view, or from a moral point of view, an ethical point of view, but also from a practical point of view. You have millions of Palestinian, Arabs, Christians, and Muslims living in their historic homeland. Some are still living in their cities and their towns, and others are living in refugee camps. And you have millions of Israeli Jews who are living there, and the nature of Israeli colonialism even made it impossible for any sort of clear separation, any clear line to be withdrawn to separate Jews from Arabs. And, and, and really, I mean, just think about this. We live in the 20th century, 21st century, and we still even talking about separation of races. I mean, that concept itself should be so outdated and so ridiculous. Anachronic. <laughs> exactly, to the point that we shouldn't even be having a conversation on, on any solution that respects the racial, sectarian, religious, and ethnic identities of any groups. We can find a way to be, to coexist. In fact, we are coexisting, and that's the problem. I mean, some people, one, one Israeli peace activist asked me once, he said, Ramzi, you are like uh, someone who can't um, climb Kilimanjaro, and, and then he decides, I'm going to climb Everest. If you can't establish two states, how can you demand a one state? And the ridiculous element in that is that we are actually living the one state reality now, not in the future, now. We are there. We are living, millions of us, living between Jordan River to the sea. 
But we are living according to a completely different set of rules. You have the privileged Israeli Jewish citizen, and you have the underprivileged Palestinian living under so many different manifestations. I don't think we even have enough time to discuss the various legal identities of the Palestinians living in Palestine. You have Palestinians in Gaza living under siege. Israel says, we left Gaza in 2005. We're not responsible for them. The international community and the United Nations says, no, 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 no. You are still an occupying power. You can't just do that. They can't leave or come back without your permission. You are an occupying power. The West Bank is divided to area A, B, and C. A, living under uh, Palestinian autonomy. But the Israeli military is there. B, living under Palestinian-Israeli control, but the Israeli military is there. Area C, complete Israeli control. But then you have the Palestinians living in East Jerusalem who are residents, but not Israeli citizens. And then you have the Palestinian-Israeli citizen that is treated as a third or a fourth class citizen. And then you have the Palestinian like myself who is living in exile. In Arabic, we call it Shatat. We are Shatat Palestinians are scattered all over the place. We have no rights. We don't have any legal claim from an Israeli point of view. So we are living in that one state's reality, but I have so many, you wouldn't believe when I left Gaza how many ID cards I had to produce to the Israeli soldier to convince him that I need to leave. My original Palestinian ID, a special kind of travel document called La Se Passe that had, says, Name, Ramsey Barut. Nationality, undefined. Undefined. So when I left Israel, the first border police I found in, in Egypt and then eventually in the US, they would look at this, says, this undefined. What does it mean? I, I don't know. Who are you? What country are you from? I said, I'm Palestinian. But it doesn't say so on your travel document. How can I get you into the United States? I mean, imagine. So you have all of these various legal hurdles and identity issues, and, and we have been trying to deal with this for, but in actuality, if you remove all of these ideas from me and burn them, and give me a travel document that says Ramzi Barut, Palestinian. This is his place of residence. He can go and come back whenever he wants to. And he can vote in elections, and he has access to water, and electricity, and food, and jobs, and hospitals, like everybody else, I don't have any problem. That's your solution right there. Now, I know that this is eventually going to be the solution. Because, because Israel, for many years, has fought the idea that it is an apartheid state. Remember when, when Jimmy Carter came up with his book, Palestine, Peace, Not Apartheid? And the Zionists were very angry. You can't be a former American president and use the term apartheid in this case. They were very angry. And we, as Palestinians, pushed very, very hard to, to accentuate and to confirm that term within the context of Israeli occupation of Palestine. And now, the term apartheid is becoming so linked to Israel, to the point that this is going to be the fight in the future. Palestinians versus Israeli apartheid. When was the last time an apartheid regime has managed to sustain itself for eternity? It's only the matter of time. And the other reason that I am optimistic is, is the fact that what happened last May in Palestine. Because for a long time, they kept telling us, you are West Bankers and you are Gazans. You are this, you are that. Palestinian Arabs in Israel, different situation. They seem to be happy, no matter how bad situ their situation is, is not as bad as in Gaza. And of course, the Bedouins, the Palestinian Bedouins of the Nakab, that's a whole different story. So we were fragmented. People like me, a thousand Palestinian writer and intellectual, and by the way, there's so many of us, we are just not given the platform to represent ourselves. We have been saying we are one nation, one people, one history, one political aspirations, one lineage, one blood, one everything, one, one future. May has reminded us that Palestinians are indeed one. From Sheikh Jarrah neighborhood, fighting against ethnic cleansing in Jerusalem, Al-Quds, Two Palestinians living under siege in the Gaza Strip.
to Palestinians who are Israeli citizens fighting for equal rights in Israel, to Palestinians in Lebanon, in Jordan. We all came as one. Muslims, Christians, none of this mattered. In fact, my, my forthcoming book that the professor spoke about here earlier, it's called Our Vision for Liberation. Palestinian leaders, or get, no, uh, uh, engaged Palestinian leaders and intellectuals speak out. And the idea was, this is our time. This is our opportunity. Our people rose in tandem in Palestine, and it's our responsibility as engaged intellectuals to present that unified vision for a Palestinian future. One last thing about how does the solidarity movement navigate? And I think, I think there is a problem. There is a problem. And the, pro the problem is not with the solidarity movement. The problem is with the Palestinians or with our situation. For a long time, we had a single Palestinian political uh, uh, address, the PLO, Palestine Liberation Organization, PLO. It had a political discourse. It had various Palestinian political parties from Fatah to, Is to the Islamic parties all the way to the Communist Party. We disagreed on so many things. We disagreed on more things that we actually agreed, but we had an actual platform. We had a place called the uh, Palestine National Council that was our, our parliament. We got together, we yelled at each other, and we somehow emerged unified in a certain political vision. Until Oslo came and that unified Palestinian political discourse collapsed. And as a result, the nature of solidarity with Palestine has changed. Because there is not one single message coming from the Palestinians. And really, you can't really blame us for that. It's not so simple. The situation under which we operate politically are impossible. Impossible. I can tell you numerous stories of few Palestinians trying to get together in Istanbul to hold a political platform. But if it's against Mahmoud Abbas and the Mahmoud Abbas government would call the Erdogan government and say, do not allow these Palestinians to speak and the, the conference is canceled. We have a hard time even sitting together in the same platform and talking. As a result, it's very, very difficult for us to produce one single unified political message. So as a result of this, the Palestine Solidarity Movement internationally has taken upon itself sometimes to speak on behalf of the Palestinians. But you can't speak on my behalf. I mean, imagine a, a bunch of white people in the United States getting together and say, let me tell you about the black experience in America. Well, you can't. No matter how sympathetic you are, no matter how sincere you are, you just simply can't. So as a result, we have these phenomena in which Palestinian solidarity groups, and not just that, they also found themselves in positions where many Palestinian solidarity activists actually disown Palestinians because many Palestinian people, as people supported the uprising in Syria, the initial uprising in Syria, before it turned into a civil war and proxy war and all of that. And you had people just, you know what? I have nothing to do with Palestine anymore. I'm very disappointed with them. You see what I mean? So we are constantly being judged about any political view. We, we paid the price for that very heavily in Iraq in 1991. We paid the price very heavily in Lebanon during the civil war and all the way till now, and we pay the price heavily in Syria. But here's the point. Your solidarity is not with politi pal Palestinian political factions. Your solidarity is not to judge me whether I made the right political call regarding this issue or that issue. I stand in solidarity with the people because I support those people's rights to be free. Regardless of the situation, regard, regardless of the geopolitics, regarding of that particular historical juncture or context. So we have to now redefine our relationship as solidarity activists. We have Palest a very strong and thriving Palestinian civil society manifesting itself in the BDS movement. Let your solidarity be channeled through that. Let your solidarity with Palestine be channeled through your strong sympathy and support with the Palestinian people in Gaza and elsewhere. But one final thing I want to say about solidarity. Your job, with Palestinians, we don't need liberators. Remember that famous Che Guevara's um, saying, the, 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 the people, do, people don't need liberators, liberators do not exist, the people liberate themselves. So solidarity is not liberation. These are two different concepts, yeah? 
Solidarity is not liberation, right? So what we need, we need you to stand in solidarity. Here in Spain, for example, you need to work towards holding Israel accountable within the Spanish context, the same way that someone would work within the British context, within the American context, and so forth. We work with each other as solidarity movement globally, but your fight is local. Your fight is local and national. What I need from you is to show me solidarity, to show solidarity to my people, to tell me, Ramzi, Muhammad, Khadija, George, whomever, I am doing the best I can to tell my government as a Spanish citizen that I pay taxes in this country and I, I, I join the army in this country and I live in this country and I pay my dues in that country. Your support of the Israeli government lacking pressure on the Israeli government, doing business, billions of dollars of trade and commerce with the Israeli government should not be done in my name. I just want you to know that. To galvanize and mobilize civil society, to take a moral stance on that issue. That is real solidarity, and that is the solidarity that counts the same way that it counted in the case of South Africa before the dismantlement of the apartheid regime. Second term. Hay dos preguntas, eh, un momentito, allí y luego. Sí, y luego, y luego pasas el micrófono a, delante. Uh, hi. Well, first of all, I want to show my entire support to the Palestinian cause. Um, well, I have two questions. The first one is related to what you're talking about, about how uh, can we ordinary people from Spain or Western world to help the Palestinian cause? You've mentioned the BDS movement or something. Uh, if you could, um, well, talk more about, about that or other ways to help. And the other one was re related to what you said about the, an eventual state solution. I, I'm curious if you are afraid of the possibility that it may be dominated by a Zionist elite or something like that. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. Um, I wanted to ask, why do you think the Israelis um, show so reluctant to get down to negotiating with the Arabs and Palestinian people in particular um, on equal terms? Well, um, I can suggest that that might be because they had been um, at the first place, deprived of the, um, let's say, uh, full international recognition um, to live on the land they consider to be, well, historically theirs. Um, but, well, I might be wrong. Um, we all understand that such, well, reluctance uh, doesn't really contribute much to the positive image of Israel on the um, well, international scale. And moreover, it costs them a lot to maintain their military preparedness. So I would like to uh, know your opinion. Why do they still keep on being so um, unwilling to negotiate with the Palestinians? Thank you. Alguna pregunta más? Aquí y la última y con esta cerramos el segundo y último turno, ¿de acuerdo? Uh, I would want to know some more about how you would say that one state solution would look like in the future. Would it still be, what would that state look like? Would it be like Israel, Palestine in one state? If you could tell a little more about that. La última, allá al fondo. <coughs> Oh, okay. 
muy bien eso. Allá al fondo. I want It's either too loud or too low. That's the mic. I can hear you. Try. Uh, did you? Okay. Um, I wanted with narrative towards the Palestinian conflict. Talk should be talked about in international media that it's not talked about or not as much as it should be. Bravo. Thank you. <coughs> Shall I? Thank you. <clears throat> yeah, you're right about the question of the, the, um, the one state. Um, I think the person who asked the question asked the question and ran away, or is she still there? The, the one about the Zionist elites and the one-state uh, solution. Um, okay, hi. So, yeah, absolutely. Uh, in fact, there's, um, uh, I, th I think it was in Edward Said's famous essay, Permission to Narrate, where he speaks about how the narration, the narration of any, any political discourse or any narrative of any, of any kind takes the the, 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 the biases, the prejudices, the feel, the, 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 and the look of the narrator himself and, and, and under what historical circumstances he or she is narrating. So yes, even if you look at the one state solution, um, it, it, uh, maybe the way it's, it's interpreted by a, maybe even an anti-Zionist Jewish Israeli scholar, it might be slightly different than the way it would be interpreted by a Palestinian scholar. Uh, so it is something to think about. And this is why um, we have various organizations that are kind of not operating publicly, but in having numerous private conversations, bringing Palestinian and Israeli scholars together in this constant conversation. And I know that I am, I mean, I am one of, of several of these organizations in Palestine, Israel itself, and outside. And I tell you, sometimes uh, a single use of, you know, a term or, or, or line could have, you know, a debate that could carry on for days and days and days because of that various interpretation. So it's not so simple as to say, one state, everything is resolved. In fact, I don't even like, like when I use the word solution I, I, in writing, I put it between quotation marks. Because I don't think it's a solution in the sense that this is going to resolve everything. It is inevitable. It is inevitable because, because it's either apartheid or coexistence. It's either Israeli soldiers at checkpoints, Palestinian mothers, you know, fathers, students, people suffering, people getting killed every day, living in this one humongous concentration camp we call Gaza, uh, living in, under apartheid in, 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 in the West Bank and so forth, or finding a way to coexist. There is no third interpretation. And I think one of the biggest mistakes of the so-called peace, peace process has been trying to imagine that there is a third way of seeing things. In any conflict anywhere in the world, we never talked about um, um, solutions, for example, in the case of South Africa. The term solution is very prominent in the Palestinian-Israeli so-called conflict. Why? Because in South Africa, they fought against colonialism and apartheid. Solution in colonialism dismantled apartheid. It was so simple. In the case of Palestine, they talk about solutions as if there is, what is happening in Palestine is an outcome of some sort of a disagreement. There is international law. It recognizes the rights of Palestinian people to be sovereign, to be free, to achieve justice, for the refugees to go home. We don't need new novel ideas. So for this coexistence to happen, it cannot be determined by Israelis alone, but it also cannot be determined by Palestinians alone. 
we have to accept that there has to be a, a, a conversation, a prolonged conversation, but uh, that we can find this formula in which we can coexist, but it has to happen now. Discussing two-state solutions and wasting time regarding this issue is not going to take us anywhere. Especially that the Israelis themselves say, we are not interested in a Palestinian state. And the Americans are saying, well, we're still committed to that politically, but we're not going to pressure Israel to do anything. And the Europeans, well, the most we can take is label Palestinian, uh, Israeli products made in illegal settlements to indicate as such, mm, well, how many countries have done so, Romana? Uh, Ireland and now, what is the second country? Right, um, Ireland and Belgium. And, and it's not, so, so this is the maximum that Europe would do, if they do it, is to tell their European shoppers that this product comes to you from an Israeli settlement. You can buy it, no, 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 this is not gonna get us anywhere. We cannot expect this kind of reality to reverse what is happening in Palestine and Israel. And that leads me to the second question, Israel is reluctant. Israel is not reluctant. Israel has no desire. Because from an Israeli political point of view, why should we? You know that one of the biggest uh, uh, channels of Israeli economic growth is actually the settlements. The illegal Jewish settlements. Billions of dollars are funneled to Israel through the settlements. It's a prosperous business. Forget about international law, forget about the human rights violations, forget about the settlements as a, as a shame on the world conscious. From an economic point of view, the, the Jewish settlements are the biggest channels of funds to the Israeli economy. So why should Israel stop? Give Israel a reason of why should Israel stop? This is why we keep saying BDS, because we want Israel to realize that there is a price. There is a price tag that comes with the occupation. You know, even the money that goes from the so-called donors countries to the Palestinian Authority, do you know that a large chunk of that money actually goes to Israel? It goes to Israel so that Israel may improve the quality of services at military checkpoints in Qalandia and in Nablus and Hebron. So that they, they may cement, they, they make the occupation more humane. You see, so Israel is not reluctant. Israel is playing a political game, but they have no reason to go into negotiations with Palestinians. The Americans and the Vietnamese negotiated at the end of the Vietnamese war, but it wasn't this kind of negotiations we were having with the Israelis. The Vietnamese resistance proved its durability, its strength, pushed back. The Americans were forced to sign off and to leave. But this kind of negotiations, why would the Israelis leave? If I am making a lot of money and I'm dealing with my housing crisis and, you know, housing in the settlements much, much cheaper than in Tel Aviv and Netanya and, and these other places, people, a lot of people are not even political. They're not even religious, you know, extremist Jewish settlers. There are people who are, you know, wanting to have a good deal in, in you know, in the housing market. So... If Europe keeps feeding Israel with money, Europe is, is, is Israel's number one trade partner. Number one trade partner. The Israeli economy is thriving because of Europe. But at every possible opportunity, the diplomats and politi uh, politicians in Brussels and elsewhere, they keep telling you, we are committed to ending the Israeli occupation. We are committed to the, one state, to the two state solution. We are committed to Palestinian rights, but they do everything to the opposite of that. So until Israel has a reason to negotiate in good faith, Israel will not negotiate. And the only way that Israel would be pushed to negotiate in good faith, two things would have to happen. Palestinian resistance at home and international pressure abroad. What will that one state solution looks like? There are various theories about this. There is a very good um, book by Palestinian professor uh, Mazen Komsia called Sharing the Land of Canaan that talks about a Palestinian view of that. Uh, Rada Karmi, 
another Palestinian professor at the University of Exeter, has a book that escaped me right now, but if you go to Amazon or whatever bookstore you buy from and write Ghada Karmi, she has a book that talks about sharing the land. Uh, there are various other theories, um, but again, uh, it's not really the technical element of that sharing that really matters. What really matters is that coexistence would have to happen according to a certain formula. Number one, we are all equal citizens in that land. Nobody is treated in a privileged way because of his religion, because of his ethnicity, be it a Muslim, Christian, or a Jew, period. Number two, the Palestinian refugees must be granted their right of return. And that would have to be incorporated in whatever future formula we have. And of course, many other things would have to be taken into account, but the idea is we have to find a way to make this work happen. It's not a novel idea, it's not a solution. It's the inevitable reality. It's either that or permanent occupation and permanent apartheid. Finally, uh, the question regarding the media. Sadly, the mainstream corporate media narrative on, in, on Palestine, maybe it differs slightly, let's say, from Britain versus the US. Uh, from, you know, um, I, I don't even know if it can be any worse than the American media, to be entirely honest. When I, when I first moved to um, London, I was watching the BBC and, and I was telling my, my Palestinian friends living in, in London, Wow, the BBC is really quite fair about Palestine. Uh, again, you have to keep this in mind that I come from Fox News and CNN. And they were like, what are you talking about? It's the most ridiculous pro-Israel outlet anywhere. And then, of course, with time, I understood what they were saying. This based on their own cultural and political context. Um, in, according to that media image, the Palestinian doesn't exist as uh, as, a, as a filmmaker, it doesn't exist as an artist, it doesn't exist as a teacher, it doesn't exist as a, just a person living everyday life and struggling to survive against numerous odds. The Palestinian only exists as a terrorist, as someone who wants to throw the Jews to the sea, a potential anti-Semite and so forth. It's a very neg negative depiction. To give you an example, you might not relate to that at all, but I live in America. One time I took my children and we went out for a picnic. I live in Seattle, one of the most progressive liberal cities in America. There was uh, an American uh, woman with her children and they were sitting in a nearby table. Um, and I had my children with me and we had our food and we were putting it on the table and she was friendly, the lady, and she looked at us and she asked, you know, where do you guys drive from and, and that sort of thing. She was able to tell I had an accent. So she says, where are you from? And I said, I'm from Palestine. And her re reaction, I mean, it was comical and I kind of been so used to it, but it was just looking at how confused she became. She was so befuddled, uh, um, uh, she said. And, uh, and then she could, took the basket and she started putting the sandwiches and took her children and they ran away. You see, and where is this coming from? Where is this coming from? They have never seen me as a human being. They have never seen my people are, you know, people who are, this is in fact why the, the, the forthcoming book is made, contributions made by 30 Palestinian intellectuals, including uh, uh, an Oscar nominated and BAFTA winning Palestinian filmmaker, uh, Farah Nabulsi. Some of the best archeologists, some of the best artists, some of the best novelists, some of the best musicians, not just in Palestine, but in the Middle East. Not because we are trying to give a humanizing picture about ourselves, we're trying to prove a point, but because this is the actual manifestation of our reality. These are our people, and this is what they do. And we're not lying about it, and we're not pretending because we are trying to protect ourselves from that imagery. So. That the way to combat media bias is to allow the Palestinian a platform in every possible way. Let the Palestinian speak for himself. 
and not just to speak about Palestine. You know, you have many Palestinians, like some of the best human rights activists, let's say with Human Rights Watch, working throughout Africa, the Middle East, and, and are actually Palestinians. You don't think of, of, of Palestinians in, in that sense. They're always linked to a very specific depiction of Palestine that's linked to Israel. So bring that Palestinian artist and painter and intellectual and filmmaker and speaker and, and, and so forth. You know, the, the, a few years ago, the, there was the UNESCO's award of the best teacher in the world. She was a Palestinian woman from the West Bank about her novel teaching techniques. Bring these Palestinians, allow them to represent themselves, and by doing so, you, you erode that, pro, that, that negative imagery portrayed by these, you know, the, the mainstream corporate media in favor of Israel. And by doing so, you start seeing the Palestinian as someone who is capable, not only of championing his own narrative, but also offering a vision for the future as well. Thank you. I, I am sure I can talk on behalf of the faculty. It was a chance to host you. It's also an opportunity for the students, for the professors, to hear about the real situation of the Palestinian people and can perhaps can to uh, try to contribute also from the university space to, to this. Thank you very much and thanks for all. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.